This is WCN, the Whole Care Network. You talk, we listen. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Education of healthcare and education professionals, social workers, really needs to be part of our mission at this time as well, certainly as legislators, because there's legislation in many states to support children who are in foster care or who are homeless. But there's not that same support, even though there's multiples more of caregiving youth. our stories. And by sharing them, we can truly show the power of the human spirit. Welcome to another episode of Gratitude to Latitude, Stories of Resilience and Hope. My name is Jody O'Donnell Ames, and I cannot believe that we are now in 2022. And while it's the beginning of the new year, today's episode is the last of our season. And I am so excited to introduce my guest today, Connie, Dr. Connie Sikowski. So I'm gonna give a brief story and then an intro. But in, I wanna say it was 2015, I was in a hotel in Chicago and I was there for the International ALS Alliance Symposium and I turned on the television after a long day of conferences and I saw on TV this beautiful face, this heart of gold, and I got to hear her speak and that was Dr. Connie Sikowski. She was receiving the CNN Hero Award for providing caregiving support to children through her foundation, the American Association of Caregiving Youth. And that was in 2015, and I was three years into Hope Loves Company, and I just couldn't believe that there was someone out there who also was so excited about supporting caregiving children. Connie has her own Wikipedia. She grew up in New Jersey in my home state, and I always start with the story about my guest childhood, and that's going to bring us right into the grit and meat and content of this conversation. So Connie, first and foremost, thank you for being here and welcome to the show. Thank you, Jody. I appreciate the opportunity. Anytime I get to share about the kids, I love it. I understand that completely. And thank you for all that you do. I want to share also that I get to serve on the advisory board of the American Association of Caregiving Youth. But I want to go back. So my philosophy is that who we are stems from our childhoods. And if we get to go back and think about the good and the bad, those experience, the experiences that create who we are as adults typically are powerful and more important than we realize until we become adults. And I also talk about the fact that when we are children, we are most authentic prior to really understanding who we are supposed to be or who people want us to be. So we are most authentic. And so I want to go back from the get-go to a story of something that happened to you as a child and how it parlays into who you are and what you're doing today. And I think that this really sums up everything for you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jody. So when I was in middle school, I guess between the ages of 11 and 13, I took care of my grandfather. My parents were divorced, and it was at a time, you know, years and years and years ago, when uh, divorce was not as common as it is today. 
And so I was kind of an outlier, if you will, at school and also within my family. But my grandfather was my father figure and he was really my hero. So he worked until he was 84. I wonder if I'll work that long. But anyhow, as he retired, as we know, uh, that's so often the case that he started to, his health started to decline. And so then he needed assistance. And I would do everything from his fingernails to trimming his mustache. And then as his health deteriorated, it went on to giving him personal care. Um, My mom worked two jobs and my grandmother, she didn't, she just didn't step up to the plate. I guess we all don't have a caregiving gene. And so her focus was on other things that she was able to do, but it did not include taking care of him, but it was my honor to do that. And so I moved into the living room to be closer to where their bedroom was. And I would get up in the middle of the night to give him his medication. And so one morning in March of 1960, I went to give him his two o'clock medicine and I can still feel um, his skin, the coolness of it, and found that he was no longer breathing. So it was at a time when trauma in children wasn't really recognized. So besides that trauma, it was also that I no longer had him in my life. So I no longer had my hero. And I think that also influenced me. And I did go on. I was a candy striper at the hospital and I joined the junior first aid squad and and then I became a nurse. And uh, interestingly, he really died of cardiac disease and that was my specialty. I got a specialty in cardiac nursing. Wow. So there's a lot to unravel there. So first and foremost, I'm sorry that you experienced that. 84, you will still be working, as will I. (laughs) I can see us doing that. And I think I'm so glad you mentioned the word outlier. I have the book on my shelf about outliers. And I do believe that, that people who are caregivers, intuitively caregivers, are outliers. And so one of my first questions to you is, I mean, 11 years old, you're playing with Barbies typically, right? You're still so young. Do you think who you were as a child brought you to that role? Or do you think you learned from that role? I think that always, you know, if I look back at my childhood, I, it wasn't really a happy time, particularly You know, I have an older brother who's really the smart one in the family, and he would be in the basement with his lab and all that stuff. So he didn't really participate in the family. And so I was the one who tried to lighten things up and please and make people happy. So I think that that was in me from the beginning. So intuitively and authentically, you were a young child who wanted to serve and wanted to make a difference. And that has brought you to where you are today as president and founder of AACY, the American Association of Caregiving Youth. And on Wikipedia and your description, you describe caregiving children. And I'm going to just uh, step back for a second to say that you are in Florida. You're no longer in New Jersey. And you are serving, providing the service to children in Florida. However, you're spreading awareness nationwide about caregiving children. And you have described this population as a hidden population. Would you like to tell us more about that? Sure. So I'm not sure that anyone, uh, even when I was going to school, was aware of home situations. And I think that's true today. And when you're a caregiving youth, you don't go to school and tell your friends. It's like, you know, right now with COVID, we wear a mask. But when you're a caregiving youth, you wear an invisible mask. And so essentially, these days, you're wearing two masks, but one you can take off. And so uh, you put this mask on when you go to school because you want to be normal. You don't know that so many other children are also in this role. And so you don't really feel comfortable about talking about it. 
and also with with some diagnoses such as mental health issues or even Alzheimer's disease or other things or HIV, there's still some stigma attached to it. And so, and often families, particularly families who are out of status in that they're undocumented, there's an underlying fear of getting help. And so it's easier just to cover it up and stuff it and not talk about it. So, and people don't recognize it, right? Because what you do in your family is behind closed doors. People may see a child pushing a parent or somebody in a wheelchair, but there's no thought process about, well, what happens when that child goes home? Is there anyone else there to help? You don't think about that. It's just, it hasn't become normal. And so that's what we're working on because, you know, studies have shown that without support, caregiving youth drop out of school or underachieve. And it doesn't have to be that way. So your example, the vision of a young child pushing a wheelchair is not something that we typically see. However, we both know that what, 4.8 million, something like that, children in the world, in the nation actually, are providing care. Yeah, more than 5 million children. Okay, more than 5 million children. So they're providing care for parents and grandparents, family members who are disabled, who've had stroke, who are diabetic, who are living with cancer, who are living with ALS, who maybe are challenged mentally, right? Who might have dementia or depression. These are all examples of how children are providing care. Right. And, you know, I think one of the challenges is that with some illnesses, even with heart disease or a brittle diabetic or even with a MS, you can look at a mom who's bringing a child to school and you don't know what's going on underneath the skin of that person. And so it's much easier for teachers and, and healthcare professionals and others if they have a visual, if there's a wheelchair, if there's a walker, if there's a cane or some other visual that helps them understand. But um, as one of our kids said, what do you do when somebody looks normal, but they're not? Mm. Yes. So this is a great way to really spread awareness for the caregiving children and for professionals who work with them. Maybe they do know, or maybe they don't. However, it's okay to be curious. You know, if you see a child who's at school who's sleeping a lot to think about, well, what may this child, you know, maybe this child is up at night and to inquire and to be an advocate for that child. I know as a former teacher, I had 130 kids a day, 130 kids, seventh and eighth graders. And back in the day, probably wouldn't be allowed now, but back in the day in 1988, I knew there were children, I could sense there were children who were providing care, who were going through things. And I went out of my way to support them, sometimes taking them shopping for new clothes, sometimes providing meals. And that was something that I could do. And now there are so many more regulations on how children and teachers can interact. So what would you suggest for professionals who are working with children? What's the first thing with your experience that they should be aware of or they should consider when faced with a child who seems like they're struggling? I think one of the first things is not to take the behavior as it is, but to look behind to see what what is the root of that behavior. Because we do know that sometimes... When kids get frustrated, they're angry, they think they're the only ones, they're saying, why me, why am I, why, why am I in this role? So that's difficult. But the first thing is the recognition and the understanding. And we as professionals must encourage and work towards getting information about family caregiving for family caregivers of all ages into the curriculum 
I'm currently working with a school of nursing, and we're trying to bring caregiving youth into their curriculum. But it turned out there wasn't anything about family caregiving period in the curriculum. And so besides nurses, we need doctors to be aware. We need educators. So how can we expect them to even think about this issue and look beneath the surface if they don't understand, if they don't know about it. So education of healthcare and education professionals, social workers, really needs to be part of our mission at this time, as well, certainly as legislators, because there's legislation in many states to support children who are in foster care or who are homeless. But there's not that same support, even though there's multiples more of caregiving youth in their policy. So it should be our responsibility as adults to provide that support and foster the policy and legislation on their behalf. I agree completely. So you mentioned a lot of good things there. We adults, we are the ones who are responsible for supporting children because we are the ones who have that what is the word for it? Insight. Access. Access, (laughs) Right? We have access. We have the tools to provide the support and to be the voice for them if they're too young to have a voice. Also, the best way, as you mentioned, is to bring awareness. So we're talking about the professionals that you mentioned and recognizing that perhaps a behavior is not just to not because the child is wants to cause trouble or get attention, but it could be because the child is really struggling. So being aware there. The other thing is that you're right. We don't see, if there's not a visual sign that a child is caregiving, it sometimes means that you have to learn more and look beyond that and investigate. And I'll give you an example of this. And I know you know this story all too well. But we mentioned the example of a child falling asleep. I know children who are getting up early before school, Mm -hmm. helping to dress mom or dad and perhaps toilet them, perhaps give them breakfast, then go to school, then come home to, you know, mom or dad, can be even a single parent home, and continue that caregiving. And then somewhere in there is doing his or her best to get homework done and to be a good student and pass pass that grade. So this is truly something that it may not be everywhere. We may not see it, but it doesn't mean it's any less important to change the trajectory of children's welfare. Well, absolutely. And when you look at the return on investment from a business perspective, If a child drops out of school, their earning potential drops between eight and ten thousand dollars annually, much less if they don't go on to post secondary education. We know that there's more crime, there's more disease, there's more teen pregnancy, and ultimate system dependency. So it costs much less to have an investment in these children today, um, many of whom want to go into healthcare, such as I did rather than just let this continue. It cannot continue as it is. And especially now with COVID, the needs have increased. The disparities are more prevalent. And so let's not create another disparity. Let's bring people together and support these children. What are your biggest goals to change that uh, dialogue in 2022 at AACY and in the future? Um, I know reaching out to the people who have access to these bills, senators and representatives who can actually create change is one important part of the goals. But what else and how can we be of help? So one way besides legislation and policy, which is primary and support, um, we're working on trying to create a standalone bill with children and families on their behalf so that All the family caregivers support issues are not tied to the Older Americans Act and have age discriminators. 
We also are working in terms of creating um, some PSAs, and I'd like to see public-private partnerships to focus with TV ads that bring to light uh, these issues and how people can be supportive. You know, way back at the first the first um, report on family caregiving in 1997 said that 38% of family caregivers don't know what they don't know. And so how can we hold people responsible for not knowing what they don't know? I think that that's a fallacy. And we're also working to create multicultural PSAs so that we can reach people as our population becomes more diverse. And giving these children the admiration and the appreciation. One of the boys I always remember, he just said to me, no one says thank you to me. And they are doing such a service. And we need to reach parents, maybe through, you know, local and national and state PTAs to help parents realize that if they have, if they're a family caregiver and they have children at home, that it impacts them because often um, parents may not realize that there's a grandparent in the home, what the children are doing when they're not there and how their lives are impacted and how much they worry. And when you're under stress, you can't learn. And so it's our also our responsibility as adults to help children learn. And so we need to eliminate as much stress for them and help them manage the stress that they have so that they can learn. Absolutely amazing. Everything you just shared is exactly when I think about how we can help to change this dialogue of caregiving children and how to, how to support them. Those are the things that I think of as well. And I really appreciate uh, all that you're doing, your insight and your fortitude to be the change that we wish to see in this world through AACY. I want to ask you a couple quick more questions before we end our conversation, which has just been so exciting. One is, what did becoming a CNN hero do for you and your organization? So that was back in 2012, and it really made me crystallize the fact that We as a nation need to strive so that no caregiving youth should have to drop out of school because of caregiving responsibilities. And I think that's kind of the tagline that has stayed with me. So initially, it really helped to raise awareness. It also helped to provide some funds. And people kind of remember that that just as you did, Jody, that I was a CNN hero, although you had seen it on television yourself, which is kind of remarkable. But, you know, seeing something one time, it's impactful, but we need that repetition. And so without it, out of sight, out of mind, out of mind, with people <laughs> having so much on their plates and politicians having so much on their plates, it can get lost. And so that's why the more we can educate people, the more we can show the statistics. The CDC, under its auspices, is the Florida and other states youth risk behavior survey. And in 2019, it showed that there were more than 290,000 middle and high school, public middle and high school students in this role. And so we're anxiously waiting the data from 2021 Um, which should be available any day now. And that data will help to uh, foster more recognition and help people pay attention because at that same time, there were 95 children of all ages who were homeless. There were 15,000 children of all ages who were in foster care. And yet here you have 290,000 children who are in middle school or high school who could be supported and recognized. So little by little, it's such a process. It's so frustrating. (laughs) It is frustrating. I agree completely. And it's the fact that so many children are caregiving, and you mentioned the word just recognition. Recognizing them is the beginning of understanding how to help them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Because if you recognize what they're doing and you appreciate it, 
and you support it, then that child just has a whole different really feeling about about what he, yeah and, it gives them an identity you know an identity of value we we worked out with a school district here in Palm Beach County which is the 10th largest in the country to award children who are caregiving in high school community service hours and they need that to graduate so when you're busy caregiving and and trying to have a life you don't have time to volunteer so that's one easy non-expensive way of recognizing these children uh, who are essentially volunteering at home. How do we make that national? Ah, we can do it, Jody. <laughs> we come to the Caregiving Youth Institute on April 22nd. April 22nd. Yes. Well, thank you so much. How do people get in touch with you, Connie? So um, there's information on our website at aacy.org. We have an 800 number Info at aacy.org gets to me. Look us up, call, contact. We're happy to uh, talk with anyone. If anyone has uh, friends in legislation, please let us know so that we, along with members of our advisory council, can reach out because we can't do it alone. That's for sure. It takes a village. No, Jody, I say it takes a community because you know what? We were taking one of our kids to what's called SOS Village and, and you had to go through a gate and there's boundaries all around it. And I'm sitting there thinking, people say it takes a village, but a village has boundaries. And so mm -hmm. I try and say it takes a community because there are no boundaries. I absolutely love it. And I'll remember that forever. Thank you so much send to me all of these links because I'm going to put them in with this discussion. Connie, thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you for um, sharing your journey with us today and for really being an outlier in the world of caregiving children. Thank you, Jody, and thank you for all that you do. Appreciate it. This is WCN, the Whole Care Network. You talk, we listen.